great to see everybody here uh, after two years of lockdown and COVID. Um, and it's nice to be able to get to see old friends and colleagues again. It also burns the grass in my yard. Good morning, folks. Great to see you. And uh, last day of the conference, so nice to see so many of you here. My name is Elspeth Grant. Uh, come from a varied background, like uh, many uh, women in our careers, don't tend to have a, a nice, I'll go that way, a nice curve. Founding uh, director of AAA Consult, uh, with a focus on building usage, particularly uh, for disabled people, complex environments, high rise, uh, since 2009. Previous to that, I spent uh, a happy 16 years delivering systems integration PFI programs for BT Integra in the UK and America, including safety critical. So I can assure you, cost effectiveness and legal compliance is embedded in my DNA. I still suffer the scars from that. Previous to that, I spent 26 years working in the uh, uh, family welfare arena within the military environment, balancing the requirements of welfare legislation against military law, because overseas families are subject to military law. An interesting balance. So here we are. What an interesting day yesterday. I'm not going to waste too much time on it, other than to say, in my view, it's a kick in the teeth for the 18% of disabled people in the UK their families, who the government seems to have forgotten, are also voters. It will be remembered. It's a kick in the teeth for all the experts who have spent days and months, including NFCC, FIA, and I'm quite sure Fire and Rescue Services, talking to the Home Office, sharing experiences. It's a kick in the teeth for the local government association and for the councils and housing associations who have been diligently, successfully implementing PEEPs in high-rise general needs. And most of all, my view is it's also a kick in the teeth for fire and rescue services in the fact that all of a sudden, at a time when the government feels it's appropriate to close fire, uh, fire stations, to reduce firefighter numbers, all of a sudden they're going to say, hey, we're going to change the whole legal framework. And make no mistake, I spent yesterday evening over at Port Cullis House in Westminster talking to legal experts about this. It changes the legal liability straight back on to firefighters. My view is it's not going to fly. I cannot believe they seriously are going to change primary legislation of the Fire Safety Order and the Equality Act to meet these proposals. And I am right with Paul Jennings, spitting. Cannot believe they've done this after all these months. So, that's all I'm going to say about it. And I'm going to continue with the presentation as if yesterday never happened. We'll deal with it tomorrow. So, disabled people. 2 billion, uh, 1 billion, sorry, worldwide. We have the UN Human Rights Act, we have the UN Convention for Rights of Disabled People, and that's because the UN recognised that certain groups needed further protection. Uh, this is just a, a, a rough uh, number of the countries who have signed up to it, who also have equality legislation uh, and at national level. So let's look at the UK. 14.6 million people in the UK are believed to be disabled. Now, we don't have a disabled register anymore, so this is gathered from different specs. 
In order to be seen as a disabled person, that means you have to have a long-term uh, impairment that has a substantial effect on your daily lives. Let's just look at that 83%. If we took this room as the total number in the UK, uh, it's not full, so it doesn't analogy doesn't quite work, but I think you'll get to what I mean. Everyone behind the first two rows will have become disabled during their lifetime. Now, for me, it was the day that we went to our GP. My husband had a bit of a shake on his hand. He thought he was a trapped nerve. Came out with a diagnosis of Parkinson's. It can be any of us tomorrow. Life-changing. Somebody you love. Your wife, your husband, your child. It's not a homogenous group. English survey, 54% of social renters have one disabled member. Now, they won't all be in high rise, but many of them will be. And just look at the residents, the number of residents uh, from research done by Inside Housing who are currently living in unsafe buildings. So, good old fire safety order. Now, when that first came in, I was a director of a residence management uh, organisation. I, as I already said, legislation and the law, I'm quite keen not to breach it. I value my freedom. And the first thing we took was legal advice, and it came straight back, which was a shock. Responsible person. Individual responsibility for those managing and delivering this order can't hide behind being a limited company. It's why in the press, when you see a landlord <coughs> of a hotel has uh, been fined or got a suspended um, uh, sentence, it's not the limited company. It is the person. The other thing that shocked us was it was an absolute duty. And I've retested this time and time again with QCs and legislatives. Absolute duty. So basically, if you breach that, and you're relying on something this sort of unrealistic, unreasonable, unre then it is on you to prove that it is. It's almost saying you're guilty until you've proven innocent. So if you look at those, two articles, just two articles, no exclusions for disabled people, no exclusions um, for general needs, just think how they're going to have to rewrite those articles to meet their proposals. Difficult. It also says nominate a sufficient number of competent persons. No mention that they have to be an employee. Just that they are competent and that you have trained them. There's also another um, interesting thing. The one that is most important to me is Act 15A. Being able to move away from immediate danger and safety drills. And that for me is the important thing. If your flat is on fire or three doors down, that you can at least move, have the option to move down. Liabilities. That's where it gets really nasty if you're a responsible person. It's a criminal legislation. You can get a criminal record, imprisonment or fines. Now we already know I think it's fairly widely known that the Met Police are gathering evidence ready to take to the CPS once the inquiry is over. We already know that the Salvas Consulting Fire Risk Assessment names the CEO of RBKC as a responsible person. Not a comfortable position to be in. I certainly wouldn't want to be a Peter Madison or a Janice Ray. So, what other legislation do we have to think of? Well, there's loads of it. We've got building regs. I'm sure you're all uh, pretty familiar with Part B and Part M. All hangs together, though. I was quite impressed that the legislation hung together as far as disabled people. Housing Act, all about safety in buildings. And then it gets really interesting, Health and Safety at Work Act, Management of Health and Safety at Work Regulations. So, if you use waking watches on your our strategy for evacuation, remember they're employees, you have a duty of care, so you have a liability if they have damage from toxic gases because they're running up and down a building banging on doors, you have a liability. Public sector equality duty, another duty on our public sector. Now, 
As you know, I'm a full supporter of our fire and rescue services. I have one difficulty. I did an FOI request on enforcement in general needs buildings as far as Article 14 and 15, right across the English uh, fire and rescue services. I asked the question, since the Phase 1 report and recommendations were issued, how many enforcement actions have been taken for Articles 14 and 15 in general needs? 1,294. And then, of course, I asked, and how many of these involved means of escape for disabled people? Anybody like to guess? One. And actually, I'm being generous there. I'm being extremely... How does that meet the public sector equality duty? I, I can't get my head around that. And that's not because people are nasty people or our fire and rescue services are incompetent, but we seem to have this culture that this particular group of people, if you said that about people of a different ethnic minority, religion, I'd suggest you'd be up in court. And then, of course, we have the Equality Act. Civil law, not criminal, all about money. Uh, interesting with the Equality Act, liabilities, fines, compensation claims. Now, we know that there are compensation claims in the pipeline from the Grenfell fire, test cases. So for the high band on the Ventro scale, 25,700 to 42,000. Now that's awarded for continued discrimination and causing great stress. Think about disabled residents, how much stress. They are scared, they have no option. They don't have the options of us. Of course, you could get rid of discrimination. You could lock the fire doors as soon as the... Um, just don't have any fire means of escape. Lock them, the fire doors, and leave them locked until the firefighters arrive and unlock them. You've done it. But do you think that's going to fly? I don't think so, because I think the general public wouldn't, uh, wouldn't accept that. So, I think we know the figures. What is less known are these figures. I find it very difficult when I see that 25% of all the children who lived in the tower died that night. And the numbers of disabled people are grossly disproportionate. And I think we all recognise that something went wrong. And we've been struggling to fix it ever since. We have an inquiry. I think the last figures I had, uh, saw was £500 million pounds so far. Significant. The Equality and Human Rights uh, Commission said that the lack of evacuation planning for disabled people breached the right to life, failed to protect. As we've already heard, the inquiry made recommendations, and here we are in, 20, in 2022, going backwards. Not too sure about the peeps in PIBs. Um, soldiers go to war with iPads, electronic information, ruggedized. They face bullets. How come we're wandering about with bits of flappy paper on a wet night at 3 a.m. with horizontal rain? Is that really how technical we are? Bearing in mind, I do come from the systems integration background. Just a note, this is uh, the PIB code of practice, and there's an interesting bit there. It um, defines that for category one, and I think this was mentioned yesterday, three fighters for any wheelchair user. I have no idea how five fighters think they're going to rescue or evacuate a wheelchair user, uh, given that many wheelchair users don't have manual wheelchairs anymore, so therefore carry-down techniques are unlikely to work. I then wish I could... Um, I could uh, draw a cartoon because I would have fire appliances arriving with assisted escape devices sticking out the back, or maybe a trailer. Tor Building Fire Safety Network delivers high quality safety management training for anyone involved in the fire risk management of high rise or tall buildings. Recognised by the Institution of Fire Engineers, we've been delivering fire safety training since 2011 and many organisations rely on our training for gaining competence in this field. 
Sign up for our training courses and conferences in 2023. But this defines three firefighters for every, let's just take one example, um, wheelchair user. Category two, two or less for anybody who is sight impaired, visually impaired, uh, mobility impaired. Now this is guidance for the, our fire and rescue services to do their operational planning. So if you took a mean average of two, Grenfell Tower, that would mean they would need 74 firefighters just for the evacuation. Have we got them? I don't think so. So, what's happening in the real world? London Fire Brigade have an excellent database. I spend a lot of time on it. I gather a lot of information on it. And here we have, if you can read that, the ones in red are all the incidents over the last year where more than 50, I'm pretty sure it was set at 50, residents had evacuated prior to the arrival of the Fire and Rescue Services. Prior to the arrival. And you'll see there are three instances, I'm in difficulty actually reading it myself, in January where 100 residents had got themselves out of a building. So where we as an industry are going, huh, we can't evacuate. No injuries, no fatalities. They're working it out for themselves. This suggests to me that our residents in general needs no longer trust us as an industry. They don't trust their buildings. They're getting out. But can we be surprised? Every time I see a fire appliance on, on the telly, on the news, there's a big thing on the side. Get out, stay out. Well, there should be another bit. Unless you're disabled, or unless you live in high-rise, in which case, stay in. So, how does that happen? Again, if you were here yesterday, you would have seen this, uh, this graph before. The government, in fact, I read it last night in the documentation. Response times are absolutely brilliant, aren't they? Calm the public. Keep them calm. Maybe don't give them the truth. 7.5 minutes. Average, it could be a lot longer if you live somewhere else. But then, of course, it's actually 25 minutes before uh, your friendly firefighter is going to turn up at your door. 25 minutes. Anybody like to put their hands up that they would advise somebody they love to stay in the immediate vicinity of a fire for 25 minutes? Maybe longer? I certainly wouldn't. I want people I love out there. Disabled people are frequently told, don't worry, love. Fire station is only just around the corner. We'll be with you in five minutes. We'll get you out. My colleague, Jess Valdani, international basket player, wheelchair user, paraplegic. One of our lead trainers. He remarked to me, hey, so I'm a wheelchair user, I'm a paraplegic, I have a good life, I'm married, I have three children. I'm the major breadwinner. Shall I go to work? In the morning, a bit tired, come back, go to bed early. There's a fire in my building. There's no way I can get out. So I'm rescued by a firefighter, helpfully. Thank you, I'm alive by the morning. One problem, I'm now a quadriplegic. And there are many disabled people who are scared to death of fire, but also scared to death of their impairments being exacerbated through rescues. And I think anybody, I'm not, I haven't been involved in a rescue, but I have read data and evidence. Rescues aren't gentle. Those of you that met Sarah Rennie, can you imagine picking her up out of her specialist wheelchair? dragging her down the floor. Well, she has osteoporosis, she won't mind me telling you. Likely to have ribs that will puncture her vital organs. Not a great success story to write in your incident report. Oh, sorry, the victim died three, day, three, three stairs down. Not good. And then, of course, we have this other one, if you're in a vicinity of a fire for more than 20 minutes. Now, remember, this is evidence. This is research data on home office IRS data. This isn't pick fingers, this isn't a mantra. 
This is solid data going back to 29, 2010. Speaks for itself. So, here we have it. It's not practical, is it? Not proportionate. I mean, after all, they're disabled people. What do they contribute? But the worst thing is that third bullet point to me that stated to the entire world that a section of the UK or English population was less important than anybody else. Survival of the fittest. Is that really who we are? Is that who we are as an industry? I don't think so. I look at your faces. None of you believe in that. I don't think it's what our firefighters believe. And it is absolutely appalling. We have got increase in injuries and fatalities. Rising. On safety, the most insulting thing is to say that. Brian Martin, senior civil servant at the inquiry, was asked by the QC. So people die in their flats because they're bed-bound. Not terribly happy about that terminology. Because it's too expensive to have a system to get them out. Answer. I suppose so. Was that gov British government policy? Answer. That was what was considered at the time to be the prevailing reasonable approach to the problem. Would you like your loved one referred to as a problem? <laughs> I mean, I'm outraged. I'm still outraged by that statement. Interestingly enough, I am the lady that Bran Martin told the inquiry and described me as an argumentative member of the public, and whatever you do, don't talk about legislation with her. Well, I'm going to have a tea shirt made, I think. <laughs> I wear that with pride, and I think, may I say, my husband probably agrees with him. So back to practicality. Okay, let's drill down into those figures. Everyone you talk to about peaks is <gasps> wheelchair users. But actually, look where wheelchair and the number of wheelchair users. 1.2 million. And actually, 50% of those are not confined. They don't like the term confined to their wheelchairs, but can leave their wheelchairs. Some of them can go downstairs and would prefer to on their backsides because they don't want to be there waiting. Let's look at somebody with arthritis. Affects the hands. So we're looking at door pressures, doors opening easily. Diabetes and osteoporosis. I've already mentioned about osteoporosis. Bone density, brittle bones. Many, many conditions have that. So we need to think, what is the sort of assisted escape device to remove them safely? Oh, and I haven't mentioned my concerns about probably back injuries to firefighters rescuing and evacuating people. Autistic. An autistic person is... And I'm nearly going. Am I really? <laughs> I've got the time out. So I am going to very quickly do myth-busting perceptions. They're not all wheelchair users. They don't prefer staying put. They don't start fires. They are not Billy no mates. Buddies do not have to be an employee. And residents don't talk or care about each other. So very quickly, here you go people are implementing, including our BKC. Every resident who requires a PEEP, and that's a really interesting thing, our BKC are using family members, care staff, and willing neighbours. No such thing as zero risk. And in fact, legal, actually, um, legal advice is there's less risk using a volunteer. So, the Institution of Fire Engineers seem to believe it's practical. We've been running courses since 2011, accredited, now on an e-learning platform, which we believe is essential to give people uh, resources. So, a flowchart. It's all about documentation and data. Before we all give up the will to live, I'm going to go on quite quickly now obviously talk too much. Um, much of this documentation you already have. So we're looking at, looking at the dynamics. I believe documentation is there to make you think through the, the challenges and the issues. 
Training is important. Your physical environment. You're not going to knock it all down and put in second staircases. You probably aren't even going to put in an evacuation lift. But if you have contrasting sur surfaces, meet part M, handrails either side, going round uh, landings, contrasting nosings, using colour, use extra fire doors in lift lobbies to create, uh, to create um, refuges. All very simple things. Identify. Come on. Most organisations have, have a huge amount of information, whether it's at least sign up because they need to make accessible changes. Join up the dots. Uh, Sumitra from LB Waltham Forest, they put in network fire safety. Every single contractor, every person going in and out of those buildings are asked to alert if they see somebody they think might not be able to evacuate. A culture that we will not force you to leave. Person-centered fire risk assessments. We now have predictive alarms that can be connected, that will warn us if people are starting to, you know, have toast fires, water mist systems. We can start to reduce the risk, but we still have to get people out. Right, I am not, given the time scales, going to go through our approach. These are not tick box, but we believe people hate documentation. And therefore, these are templates and the way that we deliver Disabled people themselves can fill in the majority of the information. It's why I've put, I'm disabled, not stupid. They spend days filling in forms. Let them do it. And now I'm just... The fire alarm sounds. This is the Sarah. This is her evacuation aid. We transfer from my wheelchair using my existing hoist. My wheelchair stays in the flat out of the way and we descend the stairs. My neighbours can still pass and we can stop on the way if we need to. Now how can that be of danger to somebody else? Now I love that assisted escape device and the reason being it has a dead man's handle. That operator can take her hand off that and it's going nowhere. Low centre of, uh, of um, gravity. It's not going to topple. Friction base with governance. Again, it will sit on those stairs. If you are choosing an assisted escape device, see how stable it is. See what happens if you stand back and take your hands off it. Does it stand still? And it's really important. We did the peep for Sarah. And it was used in anger in January. There was a fire in her building. She tests that regularly. And it worked. She, by the time the firefighters arrived, she was two, three floors down. If you can move two or three floors down, the likelihood is you can evacuate the building safely. So, an allergy at sea? Women and children in the lifeboats first? Can you imagine if we all jumped in the lifeboats and said, hey, it's too long to get you in those light boats. After all, you'd be bobbing about in the sea down there. You could be injured. So you stay on the sinking boat. Fire and Rescue will be with you. Uh, sorry, Air Sea Rescue will be with you fairly shortly, hopefully, before it sinks. I'm not sure that's going to fly. And remember, the UK in the 1850s, HMS Birkenhead troop ship, set that protocol of women and children first, still known as a Birkenhead drill for evacuation at sea. So, key takeaways. Check your liabilities if you're a responsible person. Document if you're being refused a budget or being able to meet that law. Remember, it's a legal requirement for everyone, so unless the government really goes down a rabbit hole changing that, that is the legal route. We treat everyone the same. <clears throat> All our guidance hangs together. Well, does now the LGA uh, purpose-built flats was redacted. They will face judicial review, undoubtedly, if they try to do anything different. There's no guidance saying it's unreasonable. And people are implementing peeps. And I'm sorry if I overrun, Russ. Thank you.